That looks like fun. There's a big old egg on it. Yeah, I've never seen a pizza with an egg. That's oh, the only it's given me pause. Well, you know that ant pizza, ampersand pizza they have? The yeah. The chain watcher? They serve one that's a big old egg on top. Oh, the flight attendants hate that fucking thing because people get on the planes with those big long cardboard yeah. boxes. Can't get rid of them. Yeah. Well, I think it's the only pizza I've ever seen with eggs. That's all they ever have. <laughs> and you can say no eggs.
Hello. Um, only four minutes late of schedule, which is great for me as a chronically procrastinator. I'm always late for every, every place, so I'm glad that we're starting on time. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, today we're going to talk about um, what's going on at ITU. Next year is the year of the plenipotentiary conference of the, of the ITU. Uh, the <coughs> uh, when we put this panel together, we, we, we did it thinking that uh, what's going to happen, what is happening, and what's going to happen next year at ITU, but, but longer than that, has consequences and impacts for, for internet governance, and that we should keep an eye on what's going on. And we, and we were thinking, whatever, who are the people that can best give us a perspective on, on, on how the issue is going? And, and we thought of inviting, um, inviting um, Ambassador um, Benedicto Fonseca, who's the director of the Department of Scientific and Technological Teams at, uh, for the Brazilian government. Uh, Ambassador uh, Thomas Schneider uh, from the Swiss government, also following uh, se similar issues. Uh, Robert Pepper, who is the Global Connectivity and Technology Policy uh, Head at, at Facebook and, and uh, with experience engaging in ITU and Internet Governance. And also Miu Shansari from Article 19. Um, she, uh, she works uh, daily uh, following ITU issues and other uh, Internet policy aspects. And Deborah Brown from, from APC, she leads the global work and, and, and on, on advocacy, uh, also following, following similar issues. So um, to, we want to make this, uh, this panel and this conversation as interactive as possible. Um, we're going to uh, start with uh, one question for each one of the panelists, and then we'll open the floor for like, other interventions and questions. And so we wanna, want this to be more of a, of a, of a conversation. Um, so I wanted to start with, with Benedicto, um, asking him, as uh, coming from Latin America, and um, what are the the what are Brazil's priorities for Plenipot, and um, and what are your reflections on uh, on what happened on the one hand WTDC, what you expect from Plenipot, and what are the main outcomes. Uh, that you you see uh, coming from ITU on on internet related issues. Thank you, and thank you for uh, the invitation. Thank you for hosting this event. Well, uh, first of all, I think I will take a step back just to uh, explain uh, a little bit the way we see. Uh, negotiations going on at ITU from a wider perspective, which is the one we take from foreign affairs. I'm from foreign affairs, so we are not at the, in a way, at the, the forefront of negotiations from the perspective that our uh, negotiating team is led by uh, Anatel, which is our regulatory agency. Uh, however, we are tasked and mandated according to our institutional mission to, to provide political guidance to ensure consistency what is being done elsewhere. So uh, this is to indicate my, my role uh, in, in, in the context of the Brazilian government in a way is to provide for some coordination in regard to follow-up of the uh, outcomes of WIS's process as a whole including, of course, uh, in which it relates to ITU. Uh, it's, uh, in, in so our approach to ITU is uh, very precise in regard to what ITU does in regard to internet governance related aspects. We are not uh, addressing the whole ITU agenda from our perspective at least. There are other branches in the ministry and in government that will do that, but not us. Uh, so, uh, in regard to what is under discussion now in ITU, I would say we are increasingly interested in uh, being part of the preparation for uh, the meetings that will take place this year leading to the Plenipot. Uh, uh, we noticed that ITU is engaging uh, in very important discussion, for example, and I think maybe the most important aspect being discussed now is the how ITU will position itself in regard to OTTs uh, uh, and what kind of uh, disciplines or uh, rules, uh, if 
which is the case to be done in the ITU. So I think this is a very important discussion. <coughs> we are very interested. <coughs> and we want to make sure that our uh, position as, uh, uh, as a county, as government, is uh, reflects uh, the, the government, uh, the whole of government approach to this. So uh, there, for the moment, uh, there are ongoing consultations in Brazil led by Anatel, uh, very broad, very inclusive. All parties are being asked to, to come and contribute to the discussion. Uh, you may have noticed that the la last uh, CWG internet meeting that the report coming from Brazil was basically describing the process that is being followed in, uh, in, in Brazil more than the substantive uh, aspects of, of the discussion. Uh, and we think it's very important that uh, Anatel is doing that, and we want to make sure that in preparation for, for planning part, we will also be of assistance in line with what is required from, from us to, to make sure that the position we take to plan part is totally consistent with what we are uh, defending uh, uh, in other international processes and fora, consistent, of course, also with our national legislation. Uh, you know, Brazil has adopted back in 2014 uh, Marco Civil, the Internet Bill of Rights, so we want to make sure, of course, some parts are still under discussion, like data protection and so on and so forth, and there it, and it reflects a dynamic debate in Brazil. Of course, it's the, the way each, I would say even each stakeholder or even each government branch sees topics around the internet is not a monolithic thing. I think that's the same that happens in other countries. Uh, so we are working in a very dynamic environment. We want to make sure from the perspective of foreign affairs that we, the position we take will reflect our approach to internet governance as a whole, uh, that we will seek to explore to the, in the most appropriate way, in the mo fullest way, the role for ITU, and certainly still there is a role for ITU in, in uh, regard to aspects of the discussion. This was recognized by the WISIS uh, outcome document, so it's uh, it's something that is there, and we want to make sure that everything we do under uh, which is consistent with that framework is also consistent <coughs> with the, uh, let's say, general approach we take to uh, internet governance related topics. So uh, I'll stop here, and maybe I'll come back in another stages of the debate. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Renee. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Gas. I'm with Public Knowledge, in an advocacy organization in DC. Thomas, you from the you're from the European region. Uh, how um, what are the priorities of, of, of Switzerland on uh, internet issues at the ITU? Uh, what are your priorities for 2018, uh, particularly around Planning Part? Thank you and, and good morning. Uh, maybe before I go into into the into the Planning Part, a few words about why the ITU is is, mm -hmm. is an important uh, institution for us. Uh, and it goes in the same lines as, as what Benedicto has said. First of all, I think, uh, as you know, the ITU is, is a UN specialized agency, so it's part of the UN system. It's one of the oldest UN agencies. It's much older than the UN, or the oldest. Um, and and uh, so it has survived many <laughs> developments uh, uh, in the last 100, more than 150 years. Um, the fact that it, it is part of the UN system and the fact that it's based on a consensus, uh, on a notion of consensus to work with, uh, gives it some legitimacy. It gives it also some responsibility. Um, but but uh, it is an inclusive institution with, with uh, almost 200 member states and, and uh, also uh, members in different, on different levels and in different <coughs> forms uh, uh, from business and, and, and academia and, and others. So it has uh, also a tradition of, of that various forms of multi-stakeholder cooperation, uh, also since since the very the very first days, um, as you probably know, it has three sectors that all have important tasks: um, the the radio uh, frequency sector, for instance, is important for every government that has to allocate frequencies on national level, coordinated with the neighboring countries, and so on and so forth. So this is 
a fundamental aspect of infrastructure allocation and management that, that is done at the ITU by member states, which is, which is something that uh, is irreplaceable, basically, and, and is one of the core functions of, of, yeah, of providing infrastructure and allocating frequencies and, and, and other aspects of, of the technical uh, telecom infrastructure. Um, standardization, of course, is also something important. Um, and also the development sector uh, has a unique role in terms of capacity building uh, in the telecom and, 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 uh, uh, and, and let's say ICT area that is for us uh, of fundamental importance because there's nobody else that, that does, does this in, in, in a specialized way uh, worldwide like the ITU with several offices in, in several countries where they really support uh, people on the ground in, in developing infrastructure in particular uh, and also there uh, activities like for instance the, the, the uh, cooperation with uh, the ITU and UN Women on supporting uh, women in, in, in tech industry and in, in technical professions is something that uh, is also very important for us uh, as Switzerland because we face the same challenge in our country that we don't have enough women that think that this is uh, an attractive field to work in and uh, the more important ICTs get of course uh, we think that this shouldn't all be developed by men's brains and men's physics, but also, so this is just, uh, there are a number of uh, more activities that are maybe not that visible or not that known or not that controversial where the ITU is playing an important role that, that we think is, 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 is uh, uh, essential for, for uh, uh, yeah, bringing us towards uh, uh, an inclusive information society. And as, as has been referred to also by, by uh, Benedicte, the ITU was the key driver behind the World Summit on the Information Society. We were uh, the host of the first phase, so been, we've been working with them very closely. And, and uh, they have a convening power. We wouldn't be sitting here if the ITU didn't have the had, uh, hadn't had the idea, uh, took the initiative to or start the WISIS process and then open it up also to others, UNESCO, UNCTAD and, and, and other institutions and uh, also the role of the IT was a facilitator for implementing the action lines, organizing discussions, uh, I think is, is something that, uh, that is very, very useful. And uh, at this stage, I think one of the key, of the key uh, uh, things that the ITU has done, the ITU is the, the organization that is most coherent about the importance of ICTs and the digital transformation with regard to achieving the SDGs. Uh, this is something that in New York is, is, uh, has not been on the radar for a very long time in the UN and the ITU has been very consistent in the past years in showing, producing reports, working with others like the, for instance, the, the World Economic Forum where they partner on an in Internet for All initiative to signal that ICTs, if they are used in, in, in the right way, are a key driver to achieving the SDGs. This is something that for us is also of fundamental importance, and and uh, it has. Uh, I've been I've been uh, co-chairing with an Argentinian colleague uh, a working group uh, at the ITU from 2006 on enhancing stakeholder participation. So from the WISIS times, where actually also the WISIS summit was going very far in terms of multi-stakeholder inclusivity in the discussions. It was still an intergovernmentally led process, but compared to other UN summits, I think, also because of the experience that the ITU had with, in, with working with stakeholders, we have been able to, to push inclusion of, of non-governmental actors quite far in the WISIS, and since then that has had an effect also on uh, the CSDD, for example, that has opened up to other stakeholders. So, so there is a movement um, to, to, to be more inclusive, to, to be more, uh, yeah, working more in cooperation with, with other entities, with other UN entities, but also with private entities. And this is uh, now coming to, to some of the goals for us for, for the, for the Planipot. We think that uh, <coughs> given the challenges that we face and the opportunities that are there, we would support the ITU to further strengthen I its openness, further uh, uh, develop their cooperations with other actors to, to, to work together for, for shared goals. Uh, so openness and, and, and multi-stakeholder cooperation on the ground, but also on strategic and, and political level is something that we think is, is, is can and should be further, further enhanced. 
and, and also, of course, transparency and accountability is an issue for every, let's say, big institution, whether it's a, a part of the UN system or it's a private sector-led institution. If you have a certain size, then you have uh, responsibilities in terms of transparency and accountability. That is an ongoing work. And, of course, we are also very strongly uh, supporting efforts to, to uh, en enhance this also at the ITU like, like anywhere else. Um, so these are, let's say, the, 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 the key points uh, for us, uh, for, for the planning part. And something I think is, 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 and that brings me back to where I started, the ITU does not do what the Secretary General wants or anybody else wants, it's a member state driven mm -hmm. institution. So whatever member states demand ITU to do, they will discuss it. And then if there's consensus, ITU will do it. If there's no consensus, ITU will not do it. So this is something that we should uh, keep in mind that this is how the system works. Of course, there's some marge de manoeuvre uh, to, to play with these things, but basically this is how the system is, is built and it's up to the member states to agree on what should be done and, and how things should be done. Thank you. So thank you. Like a first takeaway from the government's intervention is that you see some some value in some aspects for for the ITU work, but Robert, from, from you, you work at Facebook, what is uh, the, the the value that you see at, for engaging at the ITU? Thanks, Gus, and thanks for putting the panel together. So uh, the value uh, from the private sector is, is uh, um, just being very practical. Um, I mean, I could uh, echo everything Thomas has said, uh, especially in the R sector, right? So you know for um, uh, you know, a company that, you know, what we're trying to do is uh, connect the four billion people that are not connected on the planet, and we're building systems and inventing technology and taking a long-term view on technology development and deployment. Um, uh, and the fact that everybody's being connected to their devices and by radio. So, you know, the we spent we spent a lot of time uh, at WRC 15. We're going to spend a lot of time at WRC 19. Um, we're involved in all of the prep meetings. Um, uh, nothing happens without Spectrum, and uh, so you know you have this global resource, right? That um, uh, you know the ITU is the uh, you know effectively the you know, sets the global structure for sharing of spectrum. Uh, so it's an essential function. And if you go through the thought exercise, if there was no ITU, um, so what? The first thing people would say is we need something to have global conversations and agreements on spectrum. So, uh, you know, it's again very, very, very practical. Um, and the, the, what's interesting, uh, having been doing this a very long time um, is the evolution even within the R sector uh, moving from traditional very very traditional command and control you know licensed spectrum uh, and if you go back 20 25 years at the WRC even conversations about unlicensed was mm, you know not so much well you know it's the the evolution has really moved right and you know it's a process it's a journey um, and, uh, you know, we're moving into the next generations of, of looking at spectrum, which, you know, the next big thing in spectrum is spectrum sharing. Um, there's always going to be licensed, or at least for the foreseeable future. There's going to be new techniques for sharing. There's going to be new um, models for unlicensed, uh, you know, very high frequencies. Um, and those are the conversations that are really, really important and very constructive. And uh, so, you know, it, that to me is, ex is, is, is sort of the, the real value. I think that uh, one of the things, though, that is important, uh, and by the way, I agree completely with Thomas on the, um, uh, the capacity building. Um, the, from, a, again, a, a, a private sector perspective, um, you go back um, now maybe 20 years uh, w within the D sector as it was getting started and some of the work that Hamid and Torre did uh, creating the Global Symposium for Regulators. And when it started, it was literally, right, you could fit all of the, 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 the independent regulators into this room um, and, you, and, and there'd be empty seats, 
Uh, that's evolved over time, and some of the work that was done through the GSR on regulatory principles, um, uh, the importance of competition, uh, the, the uh, structure and recommendations on creating independent um, regulators globally uh, with those principles has been extremely valuable, uh, and it really moved the needle. Um, the third thing is, um, you know, the, the you know we we tend to you know when we talk about have these conversations about ITU, people focus on the Plenty Pot um, or WTDC, you know, last month and so on. Um, but you know, there are at a very different level, the working level. There's some incredible staff, uh, and who are doing some really really good work. And you know, we've partnered with them. There's a you know an advert an advert for this afternoon. There's a um, panel being put together with OECD and ITU on rural you know, broadband connectivity. Uh, there are people there who actually uh, you know, I've partnered with on doing research and publishing, looking at things like um, mapping uh, you know, machine to machine and IoT to the SDGs. Um, at, so at the working level, there, you know, there's a lot of value. I do think, though, that we have to, um, uh, you know, all of this is great, but I think the ITU as an organization also has to really uh, evolve into a, a, a genuine 21st century organization. It's not there yet. Uh, and maybe we can talk about some of those things uh, because that's really important. In order for the world to get the value, we, it needs to be forward-looking um, and, you know, as with any large organization, there's inertia, right? So that's just the reality. But there, I really think we need to think about it going forward. That's great. Yuish, as a civil society representative, what um, what are your takeaways from your engagement, your constant engagement, all the trips you do to Geneva, so you, so often to to work in on at the ITU? Thanks, guys, and thanks for reminding me of how often I come back to Geneva. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think in talking about a civil society, a civil society perspective, I don't I don't claim to speak for all of civil society everywhere, but um, at least from from Article 19's perspective, it's important to take a step back and take a look at the ITU's mandate on uh, on infrastructure. Right, it really comes down to infrastructure. And from a civil society perspective, um, internet infrastructure is an essential consideration. And um, initially, it seems it's 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 um, I consider it to be an ironic concept when we think about infrastructure in the sense that it is um, the most physical aspect of the internet, and yet it's the most intangible when we think of the internet as it exists in our in our daily lives. Um, but it is the infrastructure, whether we're talking about the physical aspects of the internet or the standards and protocols that govern its interoperability. Um, that really define how information flows across the network, right? Who, who, it, uh, where it's flowing from, where it's flowing to, who has access to it. So if from a civil society perspective, we think of the internet as a civic space, then considering the internet infrastructure is, is key to understanding the potential of the internet to, um, to exist as that civic space, and specifically as a, as a, as a factor of that to enable the exercise of, of human rights online. And so that's really the position with which Article 19 has, uh, has approached the ITU, um, particularly in, in the last couple of decades where the ITU has expanded its focus to, focus, uh, to, to look more at um, internet-related policy and standards development. And, um, and, uh, and, and what we've seen, when, uh, what we've seen from that perspective, I mean, just, just in terms of Article 19, Article 19's engagement has largely been focused within, within the T sector, the standardization sector of the ITU. Um, and we see that with, with an increasing focus on internet and internet related technologies, um, the ITU is increasingly moving into areas that have implications for, for human rights. So um, we've seen the ITU begin to talk about privacy, about um, identification in the context of IoT. We've seen the ITU talk more and more about OTTs, over-the-top services. And so there, there, is, there is definitely an element in which these, these factors end up having impact on the rights of, 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 in, of internet users. 
Um, the thing is, though, that the that the ITU is a multilateral organization, and I mean, as as even, even as Robert has said, talking about connectivity, how important it is. It is a it is a multilateral institution, um, and yet we've seen that there there is very little um, capacity or expertise to really talk about the dimensions, uh, the implications, these human rights implications. Um, and so this is, it's really important for civil society to remain engaged, to, 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 to first of all, to understand that the ITU is a space that does impact human rights on the internet, um, but then to also address the issues, right? And we talked a little bit about that. Benedicto and Thomas both talked about inclusiveness and the importance of multi-stakeholderism when it comes to the ITU. Um, and I think that's really valuable, particularly when we consider civil society and and its role um, or it, it perhaps its interaction with the ITU um, it's 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 difficult for civil society to engage it's difficult that's compounded by the fact that it's very difficult for um, civil society to to really follow decision making processes processes within the ITU as an external uh, stakeholder um, and so considering the fact that a lot of the work that's happening, not only at the governing conference level, you know, the high level meetings, the WTSAs, the WTDCs, and the plenty pots, but even at the study group level, um, it's, it's really important for, for civil society to not only consider the ITU, but also to figure out ways of engagement, of sustainable engagement within the ITU. Um, working within, I mean, even understanding that it is a multilateral structure, working within that structure, but still, but still finding ways of engagement, I think is very important. Deborah, we put together this panel, APC is a sector member of, of ITU. Um, you clearly, your organization clearly spends like a lot of resources like, in engaging at the ITU. Uh, what are your priorities, what are the challenges of, of being a civil society sector member at the ITU? Thank you, Gus. And I think you can maybe describe us as a hybrid of some of the last speakers because we are a nonprofit civil society organization and network of members, but we're also a non-paying sector member of the ITU which means that we're able to engage to a certain extent in the ITU's work, but not as much as a government or a, a full paying sector member would. So we've had the experience of being able to actually participate in working level meetings as APC, but if we wanted to attend Plenty Pot or other sort of higher level meetings at the ITU, we do have to join a government delegation, which is not really the ideal position for a nonprofit and independent organization. Um, I think I'll pick up on a few points that were raised across um, the panel. Uh, one reason, a few reasons we care about the ITU is because we work on access and connectivity issues. So the ITU plays a clear role in infrastructure and an enabling environment in that respect. But we also, like Article 19, work on human rights. And there's been proposals and discussions over the years at the ITU that deal with access to information, privacy, security issues. And on the issue of multi-stakeholder participation at the ITU, this can take many forms, and I've followed the ITU for a number of years now, and we have seen evolution. We have seen from the famous WICET conference, the World Conference on International Telecommunication Regulations, um, a, a progression over the years, that at that time, we weren't a sector member. There were fewer sector members who are from civil society organizations, and access to information was quite difficult. Um, and I think it was Plenty Pot where there was a, a, dis a more of a, a robust discussion around having access to information policy, and now there's a temporary one in place. So now, as a default, documents that are being discussed at the ITU are open. It just takes one member state to say we want this to not be open and be behind a paywall, not, I mean, a password which comes with sector or, or government membership, to have that information not available to the public. And so while we've seen progress, that's that's not quite enough progress because in order to meaningfully engage as a member of the public, as a civil society organization, you have to actually be able to know what's being discussed. And there's ways to get that information. Um, a number of member states have said they will uh, give information available if requested, but if we're talking about meaningful engagement on public policy issues relating to the internet, we can't pick and choose. You can't know what one government's proposing and not what another one is. So I think we have to recognize where there's been progress and also recognize where there have been some barriers still. And I should mention that that policy will be formalized or perhaps modified at Plenty Pot. So that's one thing to look out for. And in terms of participation, as a non-paying sector member, as a NGO who's primarily working and based in the Global South, we've faced typical limitations, which include participation in meetings. And the ITU, as an organization that works on c connectivity and telecommunications, does have opportunities for remote participation. 
but in our experience trying to engage as a sector member, um, we were unable to participate remotely through speaking <laughs> in a recent meeting because we were only heard in the remote room. We couldn't make a, a presentation to the floor. And I think these are the types of things that might seem practical and small, but they really do make a difference for if, you're, if the IT is trying to engage sector members and those who don't have permanent missions in Geneva or are able to travel here frequently. Um, and then, I, as I said, we mentioned we work on connectivity issues, so we see a role for the ITU in facilitating an enabling environment for community-based access and connectivity solutions. And so we've had members who've engaged deeply on those issues and seen it to be a useful f uh, forum. And then on um, one issue we work on is network shutdown. And we see that as possibly an, an area where the ITU can play some meaningful role. There's a study group that looked at the economic impact of ICT policy. How about the economic impact of network shutdown? So we're not of the position that the ITU doesn't have a role on connectivity issues on ICT issues, but we see the role as focused. And when, for example, the ITU is working on gender and the digital divide, in our view, and we're an organization that works quite a bit on gender issues, infrastructure is only one part of it. So the ITU can certainly create an enabling environment, but in order to overcome the underlying barriers to access to the internet for women, including economic, social, and political barriers, the ITU must work with others in the internet ecosystem, including, for example, the Best Practice Forum on Gender and Access, the really good work that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is doing, and others. So I wanted to just put a few pros and cons, or positive uh, opportunities and uh, drawbacks of working with the ITU as a non-paying sector member and civil society organization. I'll stop there. Um, we promised a dynamic uh, conversation. We're going to try to deliver that. Uh, we're going to open the floor. Um, please try to give your questions and or interventions to under a minute. Uh, uh, Richard, one second. Uh, introduce yourselves when you when you get the, the the microphone, so everyone knows who you are. And again, let's try to keep it short, so we can actually have a conversation, because we don't have much time. There are some many issues on the table: openness, transparency, infrastructure, connectivity, engagement, OTTs. There are also the issues of cybersecurity, privacy, closing the digital divide, uh, the many aspects of the digital divide, digital gap. Um, so the floor is open. Richard, you were the first one. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I'm going to be slightly more than a minute. Uh, Richard Hill, I've spent most of my life in the private sector, including uh, building one of the biggest IP networks at the time for Hewlett Packard. Uh, from 2001 to 2013, I was at the ITU working on a lot of sensitive issues, as some people know. Now I'm having fun because I'm a civil society activist. I'm retired. I can finally say what I think. Uh, so the human rights issue, I think that's a very important point. Actually, if you look at the Constitution of 1865, the Telegraph Convention, when the ITU was created, you'll see that they already had human rights there. There's articles on the right to communicate, on the right of states to suspend communication services, that is what we call Internet shutdowns today, and on secrecy, which today we call privacy. Those articles have basically survived, uh, and they're quite, quite similar to what's in Article 19 in terms of right to communicate and suspension of service. In my view, they need to be modernized. In particular, the secrecy one needs to be beefed up so that we have real privacy, and also the, the right to suspend should be beefed up so that it's much less easy for states to cut off communication and claim that they're still being conformant to international law. Now, you could do that at the plenty pot, and I'm very disappointed that I haven't seen any of the states who are arguing vociferously for this stuff to be improved actually present proposals uh, to the ITU to modify the Constitution and Convention, which is international law, I remind you. And international law applies equally online as offline, so these are important instruments. Now, in terms of the capacity on people who show up to discuss this stuff, that's true. Right now at the ITU, I think we're getting too many te technical people, uh, and I would invite people who are experts in this matter to join uh, for example, in your government delegation. I sit in the Swiss delegation to ITU, and by the way, since some people know about WTO, I've been refused to sit in the Swiss delegation to WTO. Now, uh, you know, whether it's difficult or not as civil society to join ITU actually just depends on whether you're willing to pay. If you're willing to pay to join ITU, you can pay to join ITU. Or you can get an exemption, which some organizations have, like the Internet Society, for example. But lately, I have to say that they haven't been granting exe exemptions. The only real difference in non-state actors in ITU or WIPO or the UN, uh, et cetera, is that fact that the ITU kind of wants you to pay by default and, and 
they don't make it easy not to pay. Whereas in the UN, you go through an elaborate, I've gone through that twice, you go through an elaborate qualification process and then you get ECOSOC status and you don't have to pay. But the rights are the same. In all these uh, governmental organizations, we as civil society are observers, most of the time with speaking rights, including the ITU, observers can speak, but of course not participate in decision making. Again, except for WTO. WTO is unique because it has absolutely no formal mechanism for participation of non-state actors, not even as non-speaking observers. So I'm shocked that some people think we should discuss Internet stuff in WTO. Anyway, uh, back to ITU. Uh, now, as Deborah said, most of the documents are open. And uh, no, one member state cannot block the publication of document. They can only block the publication of their own document. So any member state can say, I don't want my proposal to be public. Uh, that's happened once or twice. We're hoping that they will become so embarrassed that that won't happen anymore. By the way, I was personally instrumental in getting that policy changed. Um, I think all documents should be public. I think that the policy they have is antiquated. I fully agree with Robert. We need to modernize that. And again, I would urge everybody to go activate your governments to say, come on, let's get this uh, moved around. Now, it's not that difficult to get a password. I have several passwords that allow me to access all documents quite legitimately. Lots of people do. Uh, if most member states will let you have a password for the IT documents fairly easily. Uh, which, again, is not the case for some other institutions like WTO. Now, many people mentioned that ITU has done some good things. I just wanted to make it concrete because I always like specific examples. Don't you think it's a miracle that Wi-Fi works everywhere in the world, whereas you go through this incredible hassle with the power plugs, you know? Well, the reason Wi-Fi is standardized around the world is for two <coughs> reasons. There's a technical standard from IEEE, but then the frequencies were, n were normalized by ITU. So the unlicensed <coughs> spectrum that we use for Wi-Fi was the ITU that did that, obviously with inputs from the radio sector, and I believe, Robert, you were instrumental in that back then, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, other things the ITU does, MPEG, ADSL, uh, and believe it or not, in 1988, in an instrument called the International Telecommunication Regulations, which has bad memories from 2012, but in 1988, there's actually a little known clause in there which enabled the private use of leased lines, which actually enabled the internet. Without the 88 ITRs, we wouldn't have the internet today. Which I have yeah, yeah, me I'm getting there. And so, you know, I like I like the way Robert looked at it. If there's no X organization, what happens? So if there's no ISO, international standard organizations, we don't have any cars, any nuts and bolts, any airplanes, etc. If we don't have the ITF, we don't have the internet. If we don't have the ITU, we don't have anything because you need some of the ITU stuff in order to run the internet and you need it for mobile phones and so on. Now, just a, a negative word, I'm afraid that Plenty Pot is going to be a big mess because it's going to reflect this new world order where nobody's agreeing on anything, of which the WTO meeting was a good example. And I don't think that the America First policy is particularly helpful from that point of view. I still have trouble trying to understand whether that's America über alles or something else. We'll see. Uh, so the risk is, I think, very real that the ITU gets stuck in this global dissent about everything, and then we're unable to modernize it along the lines that Robert just mentioned. It needs to be more open. It needs to be more transparent. It needs to focus on certain things and not other things. But if they can't agree anything, nothing's going to happen. So I would urge everybody here to go back to your governments and say, look, let's see how we can use this institution for good and improve it. Thank you. Um, more comments on or short er, interventions or questions? Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Blaker. I represent the UK government at the ITU, and I'm also one of the vice chairs of the ITU's Council Working Group Internet. Uh, and thank you very much to the panel and for organising this session. I think we certainly agree with many of the observations and many of the frustrations uh, that have been made. Uh, the ITU is a very political organisation. As others have said, it's driven by its member states. Uh, and sometimes decisions can be made for political reasons without a strong evidence base. Sometimes stakeholders are excluded. The ITU's Council Working Group Internet meets behind closed doors. Stakeholders are not allowed into the room uh, and they cannot see any of the documents. Um, sometimes at the ITU now it's becoming so political that we are seeing proper consensus decision-making processes breaking down. And although there are good relationships at the working level, uh, the ITU often doesn't properly recognize the roles of other organizations, and too often it tries to do everything itself. And there's a real challenge, we think, for the ITU, because 
Back in the 60s or the 70s, telecoms were largely run by state-owned monopolists. And it made sense in those days to have an intergovernmental organization to manage international agreements. But we are looking at a completely different picture now. Uh, ICTs, the internet has expanded into every aspect of life. Uh, the regulatory landscape is so much more complicated and we think ITU is still struggling to come to terms with that massive change and is still stuck very much in the 20th century. And it's very frustrating because we think the ITU could play a really important and really positive role. It has some unique strengths, unique strengths as a UN agency uh, and unique links uh, to developing countries. It's a place where developing countries can go and find support and help that they need. So from the UK point of view, we would really like to see reform at the ITU in order that it can play that role. We would like it to play a much more strategic role. The ITU cannot do everything by itself anymore. Uh, it needs to play that more strategic role. We want it to help its member states, particularly developing countries, to navigate the complex new landscape that we're all facing. It should be signposting its members to the appropriate place to deal with issues or to get support that they need. Uh, we would like to see the ITU champion internationally recognized standards, not just its own standards, uh, because standards are important, as Richard said. Uh, we think the ITU is at its best when it opens its doors to other stakeholders, and WISIS is a really good example of that, the good that the ITU can do when it works genuinely in an open way uh, with stakeholders. Uh, and we would like to see that agenda of opening up and being more transparent pushed further at, uh, at Flannypot next year. We would like the ITU to recognize much more explicitly the roles and mandates of other organizations, especially in the internet space, and build more genuine and reciprocal partnerships with them, not pretending that they don't exist in ITU resolutions, for example. Uh, and we also, uh, I think someone else on the panel mentioned this, we really want the ITU to continue to be an effective global champion of the role that ICTs can play in sustainable development. And actually, we think the SDGs do not reflect the importance of ICTs for development as much as they should. And there is a lot more that the ITU needs to do uh, in New York and globally in order to make sure uh, that ICTs are absolutely at the heart of the sustainable development agenda. So there is a really important job for the ITU to be doing, uh, but the ITU needs to change in some important ways if it's going to do that job as well as it should be. Thanks. Any reactions from, from the panel? Robert? <coughs> yeah, th thank you, Paul. Uh, I would agree, actually, that's a great sort of shopping list, if you will, uh, of, the, of when I talked about modernization. Um, and particularly the cooperative, the cooperation with other agencies. And when you talk about the SDGs, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, SDG 9 is essentially the infrastructure, which is the link back directly to the ITU. But one of the, th and so people were actually very concerned that it was just off in a corner. But if you think about it, the, a lot of the conversation and subsequent work on the SDGs recognizes that not necessarily with call it ICTs, but that but digital technology, it becomes horizontal and has a potential positive effect across virtually every one of the SDGs, whether it's education, health, um, food security, water security, et cetera. And one of the qu and I, uh, one of the questions, and this is why what you're pointing out is being I think so important in terms of cooperation across many of the UN agencies, is in the future. Um, as we think about this, do we, does it really need to be sort of the, the sort of a technology embedded in only one organization for the UN family, or does it need to be horizontally uh, across every UN organization uh, in order to, to use and benefit from the technology? And I think that's a, a major sort of future structural question. Um, uh, and again, on those types of issues, um, if you were, Richard, you know, going through the thought exercise of, you know, sort of not having something starting with a blank piece of paper, how would you organize it? And, <coughs> you know, and you could end up on those things with, you know, chief technology officers in every UN agency talking about how do you use technology for the mission 
of the, not just the agency like a, internally, but externally to meet the goals, whether it's the food organization, development organization, healthcare, et cetera. Um, and that's kind of different, but that does not mean that you would not want still the coordination of some kind for the other issues um, within the ITU. I do think that the, um, a, a number of people uh, talked about, you know, uh, the, the, the transparency, the access to information, and a genuine consensus process built upon a multi-stakeholder process in which all of the stakeholders actually have a seat at the table, including council working groups. Um, because a lot of the work that gets done is at the council working group level. Again, these are the types of really important questions that we need to be addressing um, when we're talking about an ITU for the 21st century. Change is always difficult. Um, and in any large organization, change is really difficult. But I think that's a great sort of shopping list and to-do list, and I think, I, I hope the UK puts those kinds of things on the agenda for the Plenty Pot. Um, I also wanted to echo some of Paul's excellent points, um, particularly want to underscore the fact, and I think this is something that um, all of the panelists here have reflected on, is the fact that the ITU does do very important work. It does have a very important role in legal, uh, in, in, in technical capacity building, in the work of, of spectrum management and allocation. These, these are crucial areas. Um, and so I think the concern comes when it, when it, I mean, it can really be boiled down to mandate when we see that the ITU is moving into areas in which it does not have the, the, the capacity or the expertise. And that is a, a consequence of its organizational structure, again, as, as Paul reflected on. Um, and so I think the key issue here is, is that the <coughs> ITU is a relevant organization, but its relevance is not derived from its organizational structure, it's, it's derived from from its its original mandate, it, it's 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 its core mandate, um, and I think that that should be that should be the key reflection when we consider the role of the ITU in general and uh, and the idea of inclusiveness and multi stakeholderism as part of that. Okay. No, uh, just a few comments in regard to points that were raised. I want to just reflect. Well, Brazil has been one of the countries that has been supporting consistently expanded participation of non-governmental uh, stakeholders in ITU, internet governance-related uh, discussions. And internally, access to documents is freely given uh, by request. By, uh, uh, so there is no problem about that. And we think this is totally in line from the foreign affairs perspective, with the intent we have to, uh, uh, to, to translate to reality the principles that emanate from this is uh, full uh, participation of all stakeholders and uh, in their respective roles and responsibilities. So we think it is right fair that in context uh, of ICANN, for example, we are seeking uh, not an enlarged role for government. Sometimes it is misunderstood. We, we seek within ICON from our perspective to ensure the right, appropriate participation for governments. We think, uh, in spite of the fact that some other people <laughs> argue that governments have a high status in ICON, we think that in practice, as we look to the decision making proce process, the input from government is sometimes overlooked, and we are trying to. to to look into that, uh, th there's uh, some jurisdiction aspect. So I do not want to deviate, but just to say that uh, the, the same kind of points we raise in the context of ICANN, seeking to, to make a reality in ICANN, the, the multi-stakeholder approach with uh, the relevant participation. We, we also look at it in, in ITU. We <coughs> think in, in ITU, the, of course, the context is different. I think in ITU, it's the opposite, it is uh, the issue is to, to seek full participation of non-governmental stakeholders, and we are fully behind it. Because we think in each and every sense, in each and every case, uh, the, the full participation of stakeholders ensures uh, more consistent, more legitimate, more sustainable solutions, and we are in support of that. Uh, one thing in relation to Brazil internally is that I would say the same discussion in regard to what is legitimate for ITU 
to look into those areas is taking place in Brazil because our legislation is very clear that internet is not telecommunication, it is in law, that telecom internet for us is added service. So uh, Anatel, uh, the regulatory agency, does not uh, have a, a, a mandate to, in, to internet since it's not telecommunication. But of course, the same discussion that is taking ITU is taking place in Brazil. What are the limits for this? Because there are uh, things that Anatel does legitimately and ITU as well. And what is what are the boundaries? Where do you stop? Uh, what is uh, totally within the mandate and what is not? So I just like to flag that part of what is also being discussed in Brazil. Thank you. We had some more. Yeah, if we can keep it short, we have like only five, six minutes left, and then maybe one or two interventions, and then a closing round. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Kepalet. Uh, I'm from Botswana. But, uh, well, I'll speak uh, as an NGO or a, a civic society rather than as a government official, because it's not a government position. Just to share, having participated in both the ITU and maybe also at ICANN and at other various multi-stakeholders forum, what I have observed coming from a developing country is we have civic societies which are very, very at an infancy level. They cannot fully participate. We have private sector which cannot fully participate up to this level. So you will find that as government officials, when we come to this forum, there is no our civic society, there is no private sector. So as government official, we almost have to play their role. One of the things which we have been trying most of the time is when we prepare for these conferences, we call for participation. We have multinational companies. One of the things which I have always had a battle with most of them is they participate in the activities in developing countries, but they operate in our market, but they don't participate in the activities in our market so that they can influence the government decisions so that when you go to ITU, you are able to take their views on board. You'll only meet them at the last end when you get to the conference, but they are there operating in the market. And I say to them, when we are doing national preparation, can you come and share your knowledge with us so that at least you enrich the government position so that whatever position they take there, your views are taken on board. But one of the things is we are having that challenge. And I think it's some of those things because we are taking this multi-stakeholder approach that as we are managing the infrastructure back home or regulate it, we are doing it from a multi-stakeholder position that we want everybody to participate. But that participation is very, very lucky. And I think it's one of those things we need to find a gap of how, how we close. Just closing, one of the things which I have realized is in most of these go organization going forward, like Richard has just highlighted is, you know, when we go there, we do not go there with, to discuss on a consensus. Everybody go there in a locked position that you do not have any discussion. It's just that I say no, I say yes. And that's it, and until you'll spend four, four weeks, whatever, talking, and at the end of the day, you go back home or whether you vote, which voting does not help, because you need your consensus in order to move forward. You know, I know there has been debate about the issue of internet and telecoms, and to me, from a developing country, it has been very difficult, because as a telecoms regulator, I'm the one trying to facilitate the connectivity in terms of broadband and access. Yes, in terms of dealing with content regulation of internet, I do not get there. But to separate the internet regulation in terms of access is very difficult to say, now I'm providing you with a telecom access, I'm not providing you with an internet access, because both of them, they are provided on the same platform, and those are the things which we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So you will find that it's very difficult to separate some of the issues. Um, we have run out of time, so we're going to go for a closing round, starting here with... Uh, Nourish 30 seconds, one minute, if you can do it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think talking and having a, a panel that reflects different stakeholder groups is really important to start talking about the ITU. Um, and I think, like, it, it seems like we keep coming back to the same, the same ideas, the same issues of stakeholdership and multi-stakeholderism and multi-stakeholder participation, even in multilateral forms. I think... Under, we all have different, I think, different views on on 
the on structural reform within the ITU and to what extent and what that looks like. But beginning to talk about that, uh, both within the ITU and outside of the ITU, is 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 vitally important. Um, and so I think that's where I'll leave it. Now it works. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, it was I think a good start of the discussion. I don't think we are at the end of this discussion that will continue <laughs> for some time. And I agree, yes, the ITU should make its way into the 21st century, but that, that goes for all institutions mm -hmm. that are older than the 21st century. And, and so this is a natural challenge that everybody faces. And, and of course, we have different views in what that means, that the ITU should become, uh, uh, let's say, a 21st century institution, and that will be something that we have to discuss. But I think we'll, if you want it to be a 21st century institution, you also have to allow the ITU to some extent to experiment like everybody else and find their role. Because I don't, if we knew it all now, then we could just say, okay, this is what the ITU is going to do. But that's, I, I guess, not the case, and it's not the case for any institution. So I think, in, in the end, as I said, it's a member states driven institution, and uh, if the member states agree, or where the member states agree, then I think this is where the IT should go. But again, I think one of the key roles is really, and I fully agree with, with Paul from the UK, <coughs> there's more that can be done on, on, on uh, raising awareness on the importance of ICT, ICTs for, for SDGs. The ITU already does a lot like nobody else, and it's also up to us to explain to our people in New York uh, that are coming from other ends uh, that maybe uh, this is not just techie stuff, but this is stuff that really matters. So I think we also as member states and, and you as businesses and civil society, you have a role to play in explaining others that don't work with these issues that maybe ICTs uh, can help uh, achieving the ICT, ISDGs. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I think I'll just close by saying that the internet is not an issue. It's a number of different issues, a number of, uh, ranging from human rights to economic policy to um, uh, telecom policy. And I think the IT would do very well to focus on those within its mandate, on infrastructure, on telecoms and communications, and know that it's not alone within the UN system or the broader world. There's a lot of knowledge that other UN agencies hold. There's a lot of resources on how to become more inclusive and open. I just want to uh, point to a, a report from the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to freedom of expression and opinion, which did a report recently on access to information within international organizations. And I think there's a number of useful recommendations for the ITU there. So I think there's a lot of resources. There's a lot the ITU can do. And I just want to close by saying it would have been great to have the ITU as part of this conversation. Perhaps they're here and we can talk to them afterwards. Thanks. Uh, I want to thank uh, Gus, you, and uh, civil society for convening this because this is actually a really important conversation. Um, <clears throat> and this is a multi stakeholder conversation. Um, you know, government, private sector, academics, civil society, et cetera. And that's the conversation we need to have um, with about all, your, all of the institutions, right? It's not just the ITU. Um, and, it, and it's changing, it's evolving, right? Because in the past, it was only multilateral, only intergovernmental, only government to government. It, it, we're in the, the, the process of the journey to making it genuinely multi-stakeholder. We're not there yet, but we're on the way. And I think this is a really important conversation. Um, so thank you, and um, I'm hoping to have this continued. Th thanks, everyone. It's just to close one, one thing that I'm going to remove my heart as a moderator and talk as a also civil society. If you are in a civil society group and you want to engage at uh, the ITU level, uh, be it for Plenipot or other processes, or you want to engage more with your national telecom regulator, please reach out to, to any of us here at the table that represent civil society. We are um, happy to, to, to help you in the, in the process, and I th we think it's important, uh, as we were saying, uh, what happens at the telecom regulation level and at the ITU level affects many of the issues that we work on, on internet governance and, and human rights. Uh, it's not, as we were describing today, it's not super easy to, to engage, but we, uh, we can help in that, in, that, in that process, and we think that the more the merrier, and we can have be more effective and actually transform this uh, necessary organization for some issues. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for, for the panel, for taking the time, and, 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 and joining us, and yeah, and have a nice day.